Um, so my name is Thomas Kendall. I'm a application specialist with Technovis Crystallization Systems. And today I'm going to be giving a presentation on co-crystals of a perspective on the current practices, um, particularly around the industry um, and sort of how our products sort of integrate with um, the screening and crystallization development of co-crystals. So first, I'll just be touching on um, sort of an introduction into Technovis and um, the crystallization systems before moving on to the more broad idea about the solid form landscape. Then touching on the salt co-crystal continuum, looking more at these sort of multi-component complex systems. Um, so looking at the continuum as well as sort of a definition of what is a salt, what is a co-crystal and why that's important. Um, then moving on to um, sort of conducting a screen, so designing one initially, what to look for before moving on to sort of actually conducting and how you might do that. Uh, then looking into scaling, scaling up of co-crystals, so how you can sort of control the co-crystallization process um, and get the most information and control out of it and why that's important. Um, I will touch briefly on formulation. So it's only really one slide, but it's something I don't really see really gets talked about much with co-crystals, and it is an important aspect um, of trying to get co-crystals to market. Um, and then finally, talking about the benefits of co-crystals, which have been sort of wide, uh, widely discussed and sort of um, talked about, particularly, say, solubility and bioavailability. But I also wanted to touch on maybe a few others which haven't been um, as broadly covered. So who, what are Technovis crystallization systems? So what we are is a company that makes um, machines which allow platforms for accelerating crystallization research. Um, so we've developed a series several unique and proprietary technologies which sort of aid in the adoption of uh, in the uh, research of crystallization and solid form. We have a lot of sort of uh, instruments and in made on agrochemical companies and we have a big footprint in uh, pharma as well and fine chemicals um, and our portfolio sort of contains three products which are based around uh, different stages in the crystallization and solid form um, life cycle. So if you have a look at the uh, drug discovery pipeline, and this may be just for drug discovery, but also for say agrochemicals of where you have an early discovery of a molecule, you're starting out with say a couple hundred migs of material. Um, and as you go through the sort of uh, process before reaching market, you get more material available and you start to undertake more sort of uh, screening. So you may look at salts, co-crystals and polymorphs, um, then moving on to crystallization and before pro and then up to processing formula uh, formulation optimization. And we have machines which sort of cater to um, those three areas. So you can use a crystal breeder for discovery when you have a small amount of material. You need crystal 16 when you're looking at, say, larger quantities and more looking at crystallization development, but as well looking at the solid form. And then optimization, so going even to higher um, volumes of material. Um, so of the three products, we have the uh, Crystal Breeder, which is 32 reactors, um, which is the sort of point, which is the largest you can go up to is 0.1 milliliter. So we're talking very small scale. The Crystal 16, which is 0.5 to 1 milliliter reactor, which is 16 reactors. And then the Crystalline, which is 2.5 milliliters to 5 milliliters uh, with eight reactors. And all of these are multi-reactor si reactor systems with small footprints. Um, that are quite easy to use. All the reactors here are quite cheap and disposable. Um, all our reactors have inline analytics, so there's no cleaning required after usage. And it's also small, so this is allowing you to get more information at the smaller scale. So uh, when developing a drug product or any solid product, uh, solid formulations are often selected due to the benefits offered to patients. Uh, such as ease of administration, low va lowest variability between dosages, um, stabi overall stability of a, co of a compound, as well as sort of accurate dosing between uh, differences between different um, tablets, as well as sort of convenience and, uh, and ease of transport. Um, but you also, but there's a whole range of solid forms that are available. So the question becomes, which solid form do you want to develop? And it sort of hinges on two different uh, 
categories of factors. First, your biological factors. So how is it going to perform in the body through solubility, bioavailability, and dissolution rate? And then also economic factors. So how is it going to be going to perform, say, in manufacturing? So it's density, flowability, filterability, it's drying properties. And you can find it can be sort of a uh, compromise between the two, sort of finding one which is going to give you good biological results. Um, so you can administer your drug to the patient but also good economic factors. So it's actually going to be um, profitable in manufacture. Thomas, can I ask a quick question about the, the regulatory aspect? Um, so presumably um, there are a few co-crystals on the market now, but in terms of developing solid forms, is it is it as easy from a regulatory point of view to develop a co-crystal as it is um, other solid forms? So I actually have a slide on that okay. later on in the presentation. Um, short answer. Um, it's the way the FDA classifies it is being similar to another polymorph. Um, so it follows that regulatory, but I'll get into that in more detail later. So you have your um, molecule at the beginning, but obviously you can have different forms of this same molecule. You can introduce different, um, say, solvents, in which case you're getting solvates or hydrates being formed. You may look at different salts if you want to boost the uh, aqueous solubility, as this is a typical way of doing it through salt formation. So you can have, say, chlorides or bromides, different salts being formed. And within that, you can have polymorphs of salts or even salt solvates. Um, for co-crystals, um, we would then look at a similar thing. You can use different co-formers to give you different co-crystals and then polymorphs within those co-crystals. And then ultimately, you may look at, say, an amorphous solid dispersion where you're stabilizing the amorphous. And again, you can use different um, excipients to try and stabilize the amorphous. Um, so just a visualization on what sort of these different forms uh, sort of entail. You have your amorphous, which is characterized by its lack of order. And this is, in most cases, the like a very unstable form and will ultimately crystallize to, uh, to a polymorph unless it's stabilized. You can have different poly, uh, different crystal packings of the same molecule, which give rise to polymorphs. So we have form one and form two, just different packings of the same molecule. If we wanted to incorporate solvate, solvent or hydrates, we'd then in, we're coming into solvates and hydrates, where you have this uh, bridging almost effect, or the incorporation stabilizes uh, the crystal structure. Uh, before moving on to salts and co-crystals, where um, you introduce either a counterine or co-former to stabilize the crystal lattice. Um, so what's the difference between salts and co-crystals? So because you can use the same molecule, uh, counterine or co-former, and get different results. So there's a reason you have malleate salts and maleic acid co-crystals. Um, so to simplify it down, they exist on this sort of salt co-crystal continuum. And what defines whether you have a salt or co-crystal essentially comes down to whether you have proton transfer involved in the intermolecular bonding. So if you have where the if you have a case where the hydrogen is not transferred, you start with this. Uh, you then have hydrogen bonding being the, the the bonding motif, and that allows for the co-crystal to be formed. If you're then operating where the proton has been transferred, you're now beginning to have ionic bonding occurring, and then you start to form salts. And a good indicator from the outset to what might be uh, being formed over a co-crystal or salt is um, the difference in the pKa's of the active and the co-former or counter ion. So where we have a case of the delta pKa being less than zero, we have potential forming a co-crystal. Where we have it greater than three, we're going to more likely form a salt. And it's in this region in between where you can get these sort of weird salt co-crystal hybrids or even salt co-crystals where one end of a molecule is a salt and the other end is a co-crystal. It's not a sort of well-defined region in here. Um, and this pKa rule is not, say, a hard and fast rule, but it's a good indicator of sort of what's going to potentially be formed. So to just sort of come back to the questions sort of, the definition of what you have of your what your multi-component system actually of your form is is important from a regulatory standpoint. Um, as I said, co-crystals are you know technically classified as different polymorphs, so they go down a polymorphic uh, uh, route for regulatory and uh, testing 
where if you're going down a salt, it's a completely different route. So it, they, they are seen as completely different entities by, say, the FDA, which is a, the major sort of drug definition uh, group in America. Um, and they define it as a crystalline material comprised of two or more different molecules, one which is the API in a defined stoichiometric ratio with the same crystal lattice that are associated by non ionic and non-covalent bonds. So again, going to the idea of the say, hydrogen bonding um, of a neutral species, which isn't a solvent. And it's classified by this as being a drug product intermediate. So once the co-crystal enters the body, it's believed that it dissociates into co-crystal and co-former, sorry, into a active and co-former. And then this active is then treated as being the primary molecule as if it was um, just a regular polymorph. So identifying what you have, so new crystalline entities can be identified by powder X-ray diffraction, but the sort of and the DSC, and that will give you an idea of say if there's a new unique melt that can be a good indicator of a new poly uh, co-crystal. Um, and solid state NMR can also be used to sort of determine if you have a salt or a co-crystal. However, single crystal X-ray diffraction is really the only definitive proof of whether a co-crystal or a salt has been formed. And if you're doing, say, firelings for a um, salt for a salt or co-crystal, this would be highly recommended for information to include with any patent applications. So how might you go about sort of designing, conducting a co-crystal screen? So predicting what, high, what bonding interactions uh, currently that is very challenging. There's no sort of software that will allow you to do this. But using crystal engineering and sort of a database of uh, crystal structures, something like the CCDC, it's able to look at what bonding uh, structures already, what bonding patterns and motifs exist within that molecule. Um, and that can be a strong indicator as to what uh, bonding patterns could be used and then co-formers could be used to sort of recreate those bonding patterns. And something using uh, sort of called supramolecular symphons. So symphon uh, diamers where you've got say the same molecule bonding uh, within the crystal. So in this case, we have carboxylic acids, or you might look at ones where you have cut say different functional groups, carboxylic acid and pyridines um, and amine di uh, amide diamers of you sort of have this uh, carboxylic acid bonding to the different functional group. And again, this isn't a hard and fast rule. It's not gonna give you exactly knowledge of where the bonding is going to be uh, occurring. There's been several cases of where I've designed a co-crystal screen, looked at it and thought that's where the bonding site is only for the single crystal to come back and be completely not what I expected. It's not even involved in the uh, bonding structure at all. Um, Thomas, can I ask a quick question about the, the structure of the co-former? So is there a is there an accepted uh, kind of database of molecules that you can use as, as co-crystals? Because I guess the toxicity of the of the co-former is, is potentially an issue as well. Absolutely. Um, so there is a list of FDA approved co-formers. Um, I believe it's on their website. And there's like, I think it goes up to like a hunt. There's, there's quite a lot in there. Um, and they will actually give you the like, the amount is that a person can consume within say a one day period. So you can sort of have an idea of how much your dosage will be based on that. So using the crystal structure database, it's possible to see favored by the, mole by the molecule or by structurally similar molecules. So once you've sort of co-formers and you've sort of decided you want to start doing a co-crystal screen, use a sort of range of techniques. And similar to polymorphism, a lot of the techniques can be similar to what you use in a polymorphism screen. So you look at liquid assisted grinding. So by creating uh, interactions between two steel balls with solvent in there, you can help sort of ripen in between those uh, high impact in, uh, interactions. Evaporation by driving off the solvent, you sort of generate your supersaturation, dictate out your co-crystal. Uh, cooling, so again, decreasing the temperature and then driving supersaturation. Anti-solvent by changing the solubility of the solvent system completely or through slurring by ripening um, the solids in suspension. And these techniques can be used in a combination, say varying stoichiometries of active ingredient and co-former to be able to produce a phase pure co-crystal. 
you want to try and hit as many different uh, uh, crystallization routes and solvent functionalities as possible. There's only certain uh, co-crystals will only be formed um, using certain techniques. So this is an example where solvent drop grinding is giving you loads of hits, where evaporation is only giving you a limited number. And similar thing with anti-solvent, you're getting even less from that. So having a wide range and using as many different techniques um, is recommended. Um, however, it's important to note that when you're coming to scale up of a co-crystal, the only real ones that can be scaled up to large uh, scale is through solution-based. There are significant um, advancements in solid, uh, say, solid state um, co-crystallization at scale and continuous through hot, hot melt extrusion or um, through, through continuous milling, but they're not nearly at the stage of where you could take it to, say, an industrial scale. So you would need to look at solution-based routes during any co-crystal screening um, to identify a way of doing that. Um, so what you can do is employ a more systematic approach to co-crystal screening, utilizing the solubility measurements that you can make um, to miss co-crystals and then take that information and carry it forward to the uh, scale-up phase. And why might you miss a co-crystal um, potentially being formed? Where, say, if you've got a one, one stoichiometry and this is a nice behaving co-crystal system, you're happily going to sit inside this phase diagram region here, AB, which is the co-crystal of, of uh, component B and A. So it's quite nice and happy sitting in there, and you'll be able to find the co-crystal easily. Alternatively, if the solubilities of the two components are wildly different, you might actually be, go by going for a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, you won't be missing entirely and only be getting uh, your component B or having a your co-crystal and extra of component B being formed. So you can potentially miss that out, but just by going blind in with a one-to-one -one stoichiometric ratio. So how do you collect solubility? Um, so there's three main ways of doing this. So first would be equilibrium concentration, which is the most accurate way of doing it. However, this is very time consuming. So slurring material, extracting the mother liquors, um, and then analyzing the mother liquor through, say, HPLC. But this requires a calibration. And as I said, it's very time consuming and only really gives you one time point, temperature point, sorry. An alternative would be to do solvent addition. So this is taking a known amount of material and adding solvent in aliquots until you get the solution. Again, this is very time consuming and can only give you really one temperature point. Um, the alternative is using a full solubility temperature variation model um, and this is where you make several concentrations and measure when the solution uh, solution is obtained so when the uh, material goes into solution at various temperatures and that can help you generate a solubility curve so this is done using transmissivity so our machine all our machines have this technology um, of where we have a laser light going through your sample and when there's material on there, the laser light is obscured. So then we have a low transmissivity. And when it goes clear, we then go up, reach 100%, which is clear transmissive. And this is an example of sort of the data you generate of the red is the temperature profile. And in blue, we have the clear, the transmissivity. So where we go, suddenly go from zero to 100, we've now gone clear. And this is our solubility point. So by collecting across multiple different concentrations, we're able to generate a solubility curve, which you can then extrapolate data from. So the way you would uh, conduct these sort of systematic approaches to co-crystallization is by collecting solubility in of the pure components, and then creating a mix, a solid mixture of those two components, and finding the sat solubility temperature again. Looking at what you form, so with XRPD to confirm the formation of a new phase, and then you can begin sort of construction of a phase diagram. Um, before moving on to single crystal preparation or scale up. So you would collect the solubility curve of the individual components in here, and as you can see, it's quite a broad di uh, distance between the two. You would then identify a temperature where you would want to measure, uh, say, the solubility of the components together. So you would take something like, in this case, 32 mig per mole, uh, millimole per mole, sorry, and here about 7.5 or 5, you would then create a mixture of these two components together, slurry them at 
25 degrees C and start heating. And if the solubility point is greater than 25, the solubility then is no longer dictated by uh, these two components and it's more likely to be a less soluble co-crystal phase. So one did, um, where if you've got a new co-crystal being formed by having a higher solubility, you would then collect um, a solubility point across a range of uh, variables sort of uh, form, uh, co-former against active, so A over XA, uh, XB. And then where you find the region that the solubility is dictated by the uh, co-crystal, this would be a not safe operation region to sort of develop a co-crystal or at least seed on during scale up. And if you've got a one-to-one, -one, this can be quite a nice region. But if you've got something that's maybe a bit more skewed, this can uh, sort of give you a quite difficult region to operate in. This sort of information is very important when it comes to scaling up or uh, developing single crystal uh, experiments. So moving on to crystallization. So the benefits of crystallization, it allows you to control your solid form uh, through seeding protocols by uh, introducing the known solid forms you want to introduce allows you to influence particle size and shape um, by changing the uh, supersaturation generation through cooling and anti-solvent profiles, or even by adding additives, you're able to sort of uh, encourage the growth on certain crystal faces influencing morphology. It also allows you to increase your uh, purity by purging impurities that might not be able to be purged through the chemistry. Um, and a controlled crystallization is necessary in any manufacturing and legal filing of active compounds, so having a good controlled one, and I think sort of discussed earlier today in some of the uh, presentations, you know, you have to go through that GMP manufacturing, which requires a whole load of legal filings with it. Um, so having controlled crystallization is a necessity. Um, and the crystallization itself is a complex process um, consisting of multi component uh, competing factors and processes. So your compound, the solvent system, uh, the thermodynamics and kinetics of the system. So your temperature, if there's different, or phases present, as well as the process, so the scale of experiment, order of operations. Do you want to cool first and then add antisolvent or add antisolvent and then cool? And these can give wildly different um, results. Um, stirring and the type of impeller, and I think shown today earlier in some of the presentations, even the type of impeller has a big impact on, say, the results of a crystallization um, by effect of, say, agglomeration and breakage. So crystallization itself is a complex uh, process by itself. But then when you're introducing a co-crystallization, it sort of increases the level of complexity because now you have two individual components and nucleate spontaneously by themselves, giving you phase and pure mater material. Therefore, it's important to employ several techniques to control the crystallization process. Um, so this can be done using uh, process analytical technology, so PAT, such as um, UV or IR, sort of tracking the supersaturation and concentration in solution, using um, optical micro, uh, microscopy such as PVM, sort of being able to see what's happening inside your sample, um, using cord length measurements to sort of get an idea about morphology and size, as well as Raman to maybe identify uh, form purity. Um, designing a seeding strategy um, to ensure you're crystallizing the desired form rather than allowing it to be spontaneously crystallizing, which might give you unwanted forms of polymorphs. Um, phase diagram to understand the safe region to operate. So are you going to be sort of treading in a dangerous region where you might start to get spontaneously nu nucleating one of your other components? Um, and using modeling software to get the most information of the data collected. And there have been several case studies of using this um, has been able to using a combination of these techniques and um, to produce robust, scalable co-crystallization um, in both batch and continuous. Um, so this is an example of sort of what you can collect using the PAT. So this is uh, collected on our crystalline instrument. So this is at 2.5 milliliters. And we're able to see real time phase transitions. So we can have sort of the onset of crystallization occurring as they start to agglomerate, whether you're forming a foam, so this is tiny bubbles being formed, or even oiling out. And all of these sort of have major implications on the crystallization uh, development. 
Another way, one, so again, using our uh, crystalline, we're able to integrate Raman. And this is in uh, track being able to track um, the uh, formation of different forms. Um, so in this case, they have form A and form E. Um, and they're being able to perform form B. And they wanted to understand why this was being formed or, or what controls for this hydrated form B were sort of, uh, when did this start to appear? And the principle is the same for uh, co-crystals. If a co-crystal is a unique Raman spectrum or peak, you're able to track that in real time. Um, so they have did a series of experiments to understand where uh, you start to get the formation of B by varying the water activity in percentage. Um, and they found that sort of around three to four percent, you start to get B creeping in. And then by six percent, you have a full conversion to the hydrate. Um, so this sort of gave an idea about the storage of their material, as well as designing a crystallization to avoid um, the formation of B. As I said, you can track this in real time. So you have form A being formed. And eventually, over time, this converts a decrease in a specific peak and then an increase in your form B peak. And you're able to track then the formation of your co-crystal, in this case, form B, um, in real time. So just an example of uh, being able to pull these um, understandings of the solid form landscape and pulling uh, PAT controls um, is a case study of uh, a caffeine glutamate, uh, glutamic acid co-crystal, which was scaled up to one liter. So there's two known polymorphs of this co-crystal, form one, which is the kinetic metastable form, and form two, which is the stable thermodynamic form. And through studying the cooling rate and seed loadings, they were able to find that a high level of supersaturation led to secondary spontaneous nucleation of the undesired kinetic form one. Um, so by implementing the solubility, the understanding the solubility curve, by implementing the uh, understanding the concentration in solution using an ATR, FTIR probe and PVM, they are able to design a co-crystallization process with high C loading and a slow cooling rate to ensure that they're not generating too much supersaturation and they're focusing on growing crystals rather than spontaneously nucleating um, the undesired uh, polymorph. So formulation of uh, co-crystals. Uh, so during drug development, formulation consists of multiple processes, including milling, and utilizes ex several excipients to aid in the accessibility, uh, acceptability and solubility and ensuring that the drug can sort of be delivered to uh, the patient at point of use. However, in a lot of these cases, the excipients can result in dissociation of the co-crystal. So a study on the reported stable caffeine oxalic acid co-crystal found that dis uh, dissociation would occur during the formulation process with commonly FDA approved excipients. And they found that it related to the acid base nature of the excipient. Um, so you have the excipient, which has its hydrogen bonding characteristics, and these would provide alternatives to um, the co-crystal. So you would have dissociation by providing alternative bonding sites. So it's important here to say, consider what excipient you're using. Um, additionally, they found that um, in a different study of a theophylline glutaric acid co-crystal, that a uh, high hygroscopicity and high ionizability resulted in significant dissociation of the co-crystal, where a low hygroscopicity uh, excipient showed no disassociation after being stored at elevated conditions. So it sort of emphasizes the importance of looking at what excipients are, be are using and what effect that can then have on the uh, co-crystal being stability. And finally, I wanted to touch on uh, the benefits of co-crystals. So um, this has been sort of widely uh, talked about for a while. And as the, as the publication on year increases, um, you start to see these sort of same trends of an improvement in solubility and bioavailability. But what I wanted to touch on maybe a few different ones, so taste masking or chiral resolution. So I'll get the solubility ones out the way sort of early, and that's sort of the way you would maybe improve the solubility is by, say, salt formation. But if you don't have a, a, an ionizable center, you may want to look at co-crystals. So this is um, aripiraparazole. It's a atypical antipsychotic using the treatment of schizophrenia. Um, and a co-crystal with fumaric acid was discovered, which improved the thermal stability and solubility with a rapid onset improvement in the bioavailability. Um, solubility 
and so this can be also the opposite can be true so if you have too high a solubility it doesn't provide the required therapeutic profile so it goes into the body too quickly and is processed too quickly um, co-crystals can be used to modulate that by giving a sustained slower release um, in this case we have um, zionzamide which is an anticonvulsant which has a high solubility and dissolution profile um, so several co-crystals were made uh, using various different um, co-formers and was tested with IDR, which is the intrinsic dissolution rate. Um, and caffeine was found to have the biggest improvement in, solu uh, improvement in dissolution profile, opening up the potential for a sustained release of this drug. Um, a sort of benefit of co-crystals, you're able to sort of combine two actives together. So this is a dual action. Um, what we have is siloxalib, which is a COX2 inhibitor, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and tramadol, which is an opioid pain medication. A one-to-one uh, -one co crystal of this was made, um, and a dissolution rate showed that the siloxalib was in found to increase, while the tramadol was found to decrease, um, which would indicate it reduced the near side effects of the tramadol. Um, so this showed a benefit over the monotherapies of both. So a dual action uh, formulation is open to this. Uh, permeability. So dermal administration is an effective delivery method for some treatments, um, and it can improve the uh, patient's compliance and with less frequently dosage. Um, however, molecule has to be uh, have good uh, skin permeability, which isn't always the case. Here we have a case of um, 5 fluoroacyl, which is used in the treatment of skin cancer by topical application. However, it's limited due to its poor permeability and skin penetration. They did a series of studies on coformers of benzoic acid derived coformers, followed by single crystal analysis to understand what uh, bonding motifs were involved in the uh, formation of the co crystal, as well as permeability. And they found uh, improved permeability with more lipophilic uh, co-formers. They then found, selected a highly lipophilic co-former, 6-hydroxy-2-naphonic uh, acid, uh, which was then tested and showed a significant improvement in pairability compared to the API by itself using a FRAN cell. Um, stability, um, so co-crystals can offer a unique way of improving the stability of molecule by protecting sites which may be susceptible to oxidation or hydrolysis. So if you're able to bond a uh, co-former directly or indirectly uh, blocking off that uh, molecule, that part of the molecule which is, say, susceptible, you're able to protect it. And there's a case where uh, Brexipiraparazole is used in the treatment of uh, antipsychotic uh, disorders. It was found to undergo photooxidation of the nitrogen and the uh, pyra piperazine ring during granulation with PVP. It was found that uh, during the PPV uh, manufacturing, there was residual peroxides left, and this was resulting in uh, these were attacking the molecule. So they were able to form a co crystal of uh, ketosol, which is shown here, uh, bonding directly with the molecule uh, nitrogen involved in the photooxidation preventing it from being broken. Uh, taste masking. So taste has been shown to be an important factor in the acceptability and willingness of the patient to take the drugs, especially in children, uh, adolescents and the elderly. Um, Co-crystals can be formed with sweeteners and taste maskers as co-formers, um, which have been shown to improve the taste of the drug product. Um, as well as an uh, added benefit is a lot of these uh, sweeteners and taste maskers are already FDA approved for application in food. So theophylline is a drug used in the treatment of uh, therapy of respiratory disease. Um, and they formed a co-crystal with uh, saccharin, so the artificial sweetener. Um, and it was found to improve the drug release profile as a suspension. Um, as well as improving uh, the overall taste and masking the bitterness on taste sensor measurements. And then finally, um, chiral resolution. So uh, chiral purity is an important factor in uh, the, effect the effectiveness of a drug, uh, where one enantiomer can be uh, medicine for a disease and another one can be in fact toxic to a patient. Um, so chiral resolution is typically done through either through the chemistry or through recrystallization using resolving agents, and these are typically salts. 
However, if you don't have a ionizable center, you can't really go through this route. Um, so an alternative which is being investigated more increasingly is the use of coke formers as resolving agents. So you can do these rapid screening tests um, using sort of the processes outlined previously um, and then followed by chiral resolution to see if you've been able to refine your uh, chiral resolution. Um, and an example here on large scale is um, Ilamavidine, an antiretroviral, um, which was separated from its enantomer using s binol at 30 kilograms, and then was allowed purified to give a 99% uh, enantomeric excess. So being able to use an alternative to salts um, for chiral resolution. Um, so thank you for um, listening to my presentation. Um, just as quick on Technovis, we have webinars every month on crystallization and solid form topics. Um, we have apl application notes on a range of topics such as solubility, solid state, process development, formulations. Um, and if you have any questions sort of related to applications or um, about our instruments, please uh, go to, uh, please email at info at crystallizationsystems.com.